Welcome to Hillcrest. We are glad that you are taking the opportunity to view our latest video sermon. Our pastors are proud to offer another way for you to join with the church family in worship each Sunday. Please remember that live services are held at 8.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday at Hillcrest on the corner of Halleck and Newland in Jamestown, New York. Now please enjoy today's sermon. Would you turn with me to the most depressing book in the Bible, the book of Job. <laughs> you need a Bible? There's one in your row uh, near you in the rack in front of the in front of you, page 359, I think it is, Job chapter 1. Get to the middle of your Bible, turn left, just before Psalms is Job. This is part two of a study we started two weeks ago that we're calling Out of Ashes. And again, I just need to say I'm indebted to a good library of commentaries and uh, writings of lots of folks and old sermons that I'd love to listen to by Job and Piper and Skip Heitzig and uh, the late, great uh, D- Dr. Adrian Rogers. And so just give them credit for their influence on my message prep today. This is the most depressing book of the Bible. And I say that somewhat sarcastically, but it is, is it not true? I mean, it is. Uh, uh, much of Job is, it's thick Hebrew poetry, number one, but it's difficult, it's dark stuff, and so many of us avoid it, right? Why would we read something that's depressing? Why, why would we subject ourselves to it? And so we don't read it, pastors don't preach it. Um, most of the book can be depressing, but not all of it. And in fact, this morning we're going to see that from the life of Job, even out of ashes can come new life. Out of incredible suffering and pain and loss can come hope and restoration and even joy. But before we get to that, Job deals with a whole world of hurt. His life is devastated. Very few people have suffered the way Job suffered And yet, in the middle of that suffering, Job asked some hard questions. In fact, he asked a lot of questions. Somebody did did a uh, a little counting and said that there are 330 questions in the book of Job. That's more than double than any other book in the Bible. A lot of hard questions. This morning, we're going to look at just three hard questions from the life of Job. Did you know, by the way, it's okay to ask questions? It's all right? It's okay, it's okay. you know, putting ourselves in a place of humility and wanting to learn and listen uh, is, a, is the first place, I, I believe, is the first step toward actual spiritual maturity. And those who say, well, I don't really have any questions about heaven and hell and life and death, it's li- they're lying, right? And of course we have questions, we all have questions. Now, we shouldn't fool ourselves, right? I don't have all the answers and neither do you, but we know someone who does and he wrote a book. So that's why we, we dig in here. So let me pray as we, we get going. Father, we just pray this morning that you'd open our eyes. Lord, you'd open our ears. That you'd open our hearts to hear from you today. Lord Jesus, we need you. So Holy Spirit, help us. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So here we go again. Job chapter 1, verse 1. In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. And he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the east. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And so this was Job's right. Regular custom. Just a little bit of review from what we said last time. These opening verses give us a little profile. Three things about Job. Number one, he's a godly man. See that right in verse one, right? Job is blameless and upright. He's godly. Number two, he's wealthy. We don't have his wealth in terms of dollars and cents or, or silver or gold. We have it in terms of the livestock. And this guy was loaded. The Bible says he was the greatest man of the people of the East. He's loaded. He's godly. He's wealthy. And number three, he's a loving family man. Job, Job sacrificed. He prayed for his seven sons and his three daughters regularly. Okay, now verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord from roaming around the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. 
Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds have spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan's name means adversary or accuser, and that's what he is. That's what he does. He accuses those who follow the Lord. He opposes them. And so Satan says to God, the only reason Job trusts in you and loves you, God, is because you bought him off. You bribed him for his faithfulness and goodness to you, right? You put a hedge around him, and I know there's a hedge around him because I've been trying to get to him, and you won't let me. But take your hedge off and lift your hand a little bit, and I'll tell you what, he'll curse you to your face. So verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, very well, then everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So here it is. Here's the first question that Job is going to face. Number one, can I trust God when I'm under attack? Can I trust God when I'm under attack? Because here it comes. Verse 13, one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing. The donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They, they put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Verse 16, while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God came, came down from heaven from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who who has escaped to tell you. Verse 18, while he was, still, he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. So God lifts his hand. He removes the hedge of protection and allows Satan to test Job. And in one afternoon, Job loses his wealth. He loses all his donkeys, all his sheep, all his camels, and the servants who, who cared for them, took care of them. He, they're wiped out. And he loses all of his children. They die. They, the tornado, some sort of a weather event, right, sweeps and the house collapses. All ten children are dead. Job loses everybody in his family except his wife. Now just imagine, try to imagine the horror. Try to imagine the, the, the crushing grief. Try to imagine the shock Job must be in. So what does Job do? Verse 20, at this Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head, sign of intense mourning, right? And then he falls to the ground in worship and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So in all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Can you do that? Can you trust God when you're under attack? Satan's not done. No, no. Chapter 2, verse 1 now tells us, On another day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. Same sort of deal again. Again, God says to, to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered him? You know what? You attack Job, but he still worships me. He's still faithful to me. He still blesses me, even though you attacked him. His, his walk is blameless before me. And Satan says, well, skin for skin, right? The, the only reason Job still trusts in you is because you wouldn't let me go far enough. But take your hand further off and let him eat, touch his body. Let me give him some industrial-sized sores and aches and pains, and he will curse you to your face. So again, God allows Satan to test Job. And so chapter 2, verse 7 tells us, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. So not only now has Job lost his wealth, not only has he lost his family, but now he loses his health. Satan attacks his body, and Job is consumed with, with infection, and he's got these open, oozing sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And as horrible and miserable as that might sound, the devil ain't done yet. Next, Job, or next the devil is going to attack Job's friends. 
protect Job through his closest friends. So now verse 11. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they sent out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. Now that may sound very good. That may sound all well, well and good. These friends, you know, mean well. They may, they may have went well. But, but you read on, you see very quickly that these friends quickly become Job's enemies and the source of more and more misery. The devil himself uses these friends to attack, to malign, and to emotionally wreck Job. And so this leads Job to ask a second question, second hard question. Can I trust God when I am abandoned by my friends? So that's what's happened. That's what happens. They may have been better physically, but they sure weren't there with him in any other way. They may have come with good intentions of comforting Job, but they quickly turned to criticizing and working to destroy his reputation. I want to show you what I mean. We're going to move through all 42 chapters this morning quickly. So stay with me. Here we go. Chapter 4 now. Eliphaz, the first friend, is going to speak up. Chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Consider now, Eliphaz says, who, being innocent, has ever perished? Where were, where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. Let me translate that for you. Big suffering, big sin. That's what Eliphaz is saying. That's his theology. If you're suffering big time, it's because you've sinned big time. And he goes on and on about it. The entire chapter 4 is Eliphaz bloviating and expounding on his theological nonsense. And, and that's, that, that is a heresy that comes right from the pit of hell itself, from the devil. It's a lie that frankly continues to, to be propagated today. Sometimes you hear it from the lips of, of, of Christians, even pastors will say stupid things like this. Say, well, God never wants you to suffer, so if you're suffering, that means you must be sinning. You've got some secret sin someplace, and so if you just get right with God, then all your suffering will go away, and God will bless you again. That'll be the sign that you're right with God. He'll give you all the good stuff. The only problem with that is it's wrong. It's wrong. It's a perversion of a principle, a very scriptural principle, that, that teaches you reap what you sow. Is that generally true? Absolutely, it's generally true, but not always. So sometimes simple answers are simply wrong. It's not true that every person who suffers suffers because they've sinned. It certainly wasn't the truth for God, God or for Job. In God's own words, Job is blameless and upright in all his ways. God's words. I'm not suffering because he sinned. Now, thanks to Eliphaz running off at the mouth and, and you know, bad mouthing Job and everything, everybody thinks Job is a is, is a, a total reprobate. Big suffering happens because of big sin. And, and then when Eliphaz is done beating up on Job, Bildad takes his turn, and then Zophar. And each time they, they attack him, Job speaks up to defend himself. In fact, turn over now to chapter 19. I told you we'd go fast. Chapter 19. I want you to see some of the kinds of responses Job mounts. So Job, Job chapter 19, verse 1. Then Job replied, How long Will you torment me and crush me with words? Ten times now you have reproached me. Shamelessly you attack me. Verse 14. Job lamenting here. He says, my kinsmen, my closest friends have gone away. My friends have forgotten me. Verse 19. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned away from me. Anybody identify with any of this? Anybody know what it's like to be abandoned by a spouse? Anybody know what it's like to have your kids turn against you? Anybody know what it's like to have a business partner become your enemy? Anybody know what it's like to have somebody that used to be your closest friend, all of a sudden you realize they're backstabbing you? They're, they, all they do is spew garbage about you. Anybody have, ever have that happen, right? It's devastating. I, I don't know what's worse, the physical calamity that Job has, has suffered or, or the emotional calamity of losing his friends, just attacking him over and over. This goes on for chapters. So Job says each time, you know, you can trash me all you want, but it doesn't change the fact that I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing to deserve this. 
Big suffering, big sin. That's one lie. There are others. There are others. How about this one? The reason, you got to kind of lower your glass. The reason, you see, the reason you're suffering is because you don't have enough faith. That's another lie. The reason you're sick, the reason you have a terminal disease is because you don't have enough faith to believe God for your healing, your physical healing. Such a twist of the truth. It, it is such a destructive lie that the enemy uses. I remember I, uh, a family member who had MS. And this, this man got it, and uh, he suffered greatly, and his health just continued to decline. We prayed. And people in his church told him, the reason you're suffering, the reason you have MS and you're going to die is because you don't have faith to believe for healing. Your family doesn't have enough faith. This week, Danielle and I heard about a girl, 21 years of age, same age as our daughter Alexis, going to be a senior in college. She, she was born here in Jamestown. And her parents used to attend this church. Some of you know the family. You've been watching it on social media, right? And this girl, 21 years of age, is filled with brain tumors. She has less than a month to live. We were devastated hearing that. Now, can you imagine going to her and saying, well, the reason you're going to die of brain tumors is because you can't muster the faith. Or your parents are not acting in faith. It is such an insidious lie. Now, I ask you, does God heal? Does God miraculously heal? Oh, yeah. Now, does God always miraculously heal in this life? No. No, he doesn't. See, here's the truth. Faith isn't always the way to get out of suffering. Sometimes faith is the way to get through our suffering. Let me explain. And this is so important. We're, we're going to go a little, I'm just giving, putting you on notice, okay? I think it'll be worth it, but we're going to go a little long today. I want, I want to take a detour. Don't often do this. I often stay, usually I stay right with the passage, but we need to take a detour. A detour. Keep your finger, keep something in Job. We're coming back there, but I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. Turn right, get over to the New Testament. Past first and second Thessalonians, where we just were last month. Titus, Philemon. You get to James, you've gone too far, right? Over to Hebrews chapter 11. Um, do I have a page? Yes, page 851 if you're using one of the church Bibles. Some of you remember last fall, we were in Hebrews the entire fall, and I spent an entire message answering the question, what is faith? From this chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, this is called the Hall of Faith. And, and this chapter talks about, celebrates the, the faith of Cain and, and Abel and, and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses, the great heroes, many of the great heroes of the faith. All right, so drop down now to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, and like me, the, uh, the writer is running short on time, so... Um, He's been going on it for 31 verses, and he says in verse 32, And what more shall I say? I do not have the time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and all the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, who quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life. And you say, wow, Pastor Mark, sign me up. This sounds awesome. I mean, this is, this is like all honey and no bees. But it goes on. End of verse 35. But others were tortured and refused to be released so they might be gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others were chained and put in, in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they, had, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes and in the ground. And why? Why did they suffer? Did, did they do something wrong? What, what did they do wrong? Nothing. They did nothing, nothing wrong. Did they not have enough faith? The writer answers at verse 36. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. So, so how do some escape from suffering? 
By faith. And so how others endure? By faith. Some had the faith, had faith and were delivered. So others had faith and died. That's what Hebrews is telling us. I like what Dr. Adrian Rogers preached from Hebrews. He, he said, faith is not receiving from God what we want. Faith is accepting from God what he gives. And discernment to understand what the will of God is, right? We don't always understand, but as we press into the word, he will help us to understand what his will and to pray. And you know what? In Jesus, the, Jesus, what did he teach us to pray? Thy will be done. Can I trust God when I'm under attack? Can I trust God when I'm abandoned by my friends? And number three, can I trust God when everything in life is dark and depressing? All right, so back to the book of Job now. Chapter 23, hopefully you didn't lose your place. 23 now, chapter 23. Anguish, the angst continues to build for Job. He, he just can't figure it out. And his friends are no help. I mean, far from it. His own wife at one point says, why don't you just curse God and die? Wow. That's quite a woman right there. Um, so uh, just, just try to imagine that. Just try to put yourself in the place, right? One, one more, imagine waking up tomorrow morning and instantly you're bankrupt. And, 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 and then all your kids die. And, and then you get some disease, right, that turns you into some repulsive, pathetic mess of a person. And everybody points the finger at you and says, well, it's your fault. It's your fault. I mean, talk about darkness. Talk about depression. So finally, in chapter 23, verse 1, Job says, even today, my complaint is bitter. His, God's hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say. I mean, do you hear the desperation in these, these words? Job wants some answers. He's saying, hello, God, are you out there? I mean, God, I'd like to talk to you. i got a few questions for you. In verse 8, it says, but I, if I go to the east, he's not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When I, he works at the north, I do not see him. When he turns, I turn, he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. Job is looking everywhere. He's like, God, is he back there? And he's not there. Is he over? He's not there. He's not here. God, where are you? I don't understand what is going on. No matter where Job looked, he couldn't find God. You ever been in a place like that? No matter what, it's not that you don't want to hear, but you just can't hear. Some of us have been to a place like that. And we can begin to tap into the kind of terror that Job must have felt. And the question you face in those times is, can I trust God even though everything around me is dark and depressing? Job asks a lot of questions, a lot of hard questions. And he goes for, for a while, and this goes on, and back and forth with his friends. Now, in chapter 38, God speaks. Turn over there. Chapter 38. He doesn't answer Job's questions, but he speaks. Verse 1, 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm, and he said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. And I will question you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundation, the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? So surely you know. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? And God goes on. I mean, it is just withering. Job, where, where were you when I made everything? And when was it the first time that I asked you for your counsel, your advice? 
Apostle Paul wrote over in Romans chapter 11, he said, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And how unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him for from him and through him and to him are all things. Job realizes that he's gone too far. It's not that he can't ask questions, but to demand that God explain himself, that, that is too far. So now turn over to chapter 42. Job, rep Job replies, he prays to the Lord. Chapter 42, verse 1, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel with knowledge, without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful, too deep for me to know. So Job gets it, and he repents of his demand that God explain himself and give answers to Job that Job likes. So verse 4, you said... Listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. My ears have had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And therefore, I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. It's okay to ask hard questions, but that doesn't mean that God owes us an answer that we, we, we're going to think is good or right. And what I want to do right now is I want to push the pause button. We're coming back here to wrap up in just a few moments. But I want you to hear from one of our family. Where are you guys? Come on up. Um, Wendy and Lyle Roof, um, I want you to hear. I want you to see some of this in real life, what this is. Some wrestling with these kinds of things looks like. And I've asked Wendy and Lyle if they would just share a bit of their journey. So very few pastors preach on Job because it's the most depressing book in the Bible. So when your pastor asks you to give testimony during his sermon on Job, you know that things have not been going so well, I guess. Um, it's a very long story, so I'm just going to hit the highlights because we already take up too much time with this. But um, I was diagnosed with diabetes in 2000, right before I had Andrew. And I've been a textbook case of side effects um, from the disease. I have permanent blind spots in my vision, worsening numbness and tingling in my hands and feet. Um, something called gastroparesis, which is nerve damage in my digestive tract. Um, I have balance issues because I have nerve damage in my balance center on my right ear. I have um, something called Charcot foot, which is a condition in diabetics that causes foot deformation and bone weakness. And up until a while ago, I had moderate kidney disease, and all this because of diabetes. In late spring of 2017, I came down with a terrible virus. It turned into what I thought was a sinus infection that wouldn't go away. I did uh, three rounds of antibiotics, and the fourth time that I called my doctor, he said, you just don't sound good. I can hear that you can't breathe. You need to go to the ER. So I went to the ER and um, the diagnosis, congestive heart failure. Um, the virus that I had had attacked my heart and it was causing it to fail. The bottom line was that the medication that I would have to take to save my heart would probably take my kidneys over the edge since they were already weak. So after three months of wearing an external defibrillator and multiple trips to cardiac rehab every week, my heart got stronger, but my kidneys got weaker. <clears throat> well, as you can realize, the, I mean, the six months that this was going on was pretty crazy. Um, she went into the hospital with heart failure. 
in July. By October, they were telling us the heart failure was good, but by January, they were telling us that she had end-stage renal disease or kidney failure. Um, in the middle of that, we moved houses too, so it was crazy six months, and um, the next couple of months weren't gonna get any better. Um, they took us on a tour of the facilities to talk about what uh, dialysis looked like and meant for Wendy. Um, and as a result of that tour, we made the decision that um, she would need to do the dialysis in home. Uh, it was only, the only way it was gonna work. Um, they do a type of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis. And in January, or actually, uh, fe yeah, somewhere in the January timeframe, she had surgery to have a catheter placed in her abdomen. Um, and that catheter would be used to perform the dialysis. So, but we couldn't start right away. Um, unfortunately, regardless of the fact that she had everything in place, insurance requires you to get just a little bit sicker than she was in order to be able to pay for the dialysis. So we still had to wait a little while. Um, thankfully, it turned out to be, and I say thankfully now, <laughs> back then it seemed like, wow, we're in a crisis situation, but honestly, it was good that it progressed quickly in some ways. Um, and in February, um, they finally said, okay, you're at the point where we can start dialysis. So um, we started this in-home dialysis, and. It seemed to help a bit, but Wendy was still not feeling great. She was nauseous a lot, and um, she wanted to sleep a lot. And, um, but the doctors had told us that keep active because the prognosis is better in anyone who is constantly is keeping their, their, their lifestyle at least somewhat active. So she would go to work every day, and she would come home and she'd collapse. It'd be the end of her. Um, she would... Uh, She'd sleep in the afternoons, she'd just kind of be around, but um, she wasn't really functioning. Um, and nine hours a night, she would have this machine hooked up to her to do the dialysis. So Lyle became my nurse. Um, he was my number one support, and he really seriously learned an awful lot about an awful lot of things through this. Um, he learned everything he could about dial dialysis, and he continuously tried to boost my spirits when I was ready to give up. Um, throughout all of this, I had to undergo rigorous testing at ECMC because when they started the dialysis, we started to hear the word transplant an awful lot, and that was very scary. Um, so in order to be on a transplant list, I had to see uh, a number of doctors. I had to have my heart um, checked because obviously I had had some heart problems. Um, I had to have clearance from a gynecologist. I had to have a colonoscopy. I had to have a dental exam. I had to have 24 vials of blood taken, x-rays of my lungs, a mental health evaluation, financial and insurance counseling, and a physical exam by a transplant surgeon to make sure that there was room in my abdomen for a new kidney, because they put the kidney here. It doesn't go in your back, like some people think. Um, so then a team of doctors met in a small conference room, and for about two days, we just like bit our nails waiting to hear, um, because they met to, to go over all the results and kind of determine my fate. Um, thankfully, I was officially listed. Um, I got the letter. It wasn't until July of 2018, but I was officially listed, and um, the date of listing, thankfully, went back to February. It was retroactive. So my place on the list was actually a little further along than it could have been. So all that to say, um, do I dare compare myself to Job? I think that in some ways I can. Um, he lost his health, and I guess I can identify with that. Um, God has carried me through each new development and granted me comfort and confidence that there is a purpose for my circumstances. 
I've been able to learn a lot and encourage others going through the same type of pain. Um, my outlook in life has changed a bit. I try not to be so rushed. Um, I try not to let the days go by in a blur. Um, every day is precious. Job lost his wealth. Um, while we can't say that that happened to us, it sure, sure was uh, touch and go and scary at times. Um, prior to Wendy having heart failure, we had put our house on the market um, and had been searching for a slightly larger home. Um, in the course of that, slightly before her going to the hospital, we had fallen, found a house that Wendy had fallen in love with. It was a nice farmhouse on the north side of town, um, had a nice big piece of property. We put a bid in on it. Um, strangely enough, um, the owner didn't want to enter into a contract with us for circumstances that we couldn't understand at the time. Um, and as a matter of fact, he took and sold the house for a bid that was lower than the one we had given him. Um, it was just confusing. but. Fast forward a couple of months, and Wendy went into the hospital on a Friday night with congestive heart failure. Okay, all right, we aren't supposed to move right now. She's got something going on. Um, no, God has other plans. Uh, she's in the hospital on Friday. Saturday, we get an offer on our house, and a bid we had put in on another house that had gotten accepted all on the same day. Um, no, 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 no. Lyle goes to the hospital and says to Wendy, yeah, this isn't going to happen. I can't do this. But, you know, God has his own plans, and um, he chose that time to use Wendy to uh, set me straight. Um, and she, in no, uncircum no, you know, no uncertain circumstances, made it very clear that we needed to sign the paperwork on this. And I was like, you've got to be out of your mind. You're laying in a hospital bed with congestive heart failure, and you want to move? Okay, I was on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so anyhow, interestingly enough, two... I mean, this was a stretch financially. The first house we had put in a bid on was right in our price range. This one we had decided to stretch a little bit. So, you know, I'm really anxious, but anyhow, we went through with it. Um, little did I know that we needed this house. Um, our prior house, the house we had been interested in as well, were not very conducive to somebody doing in-home dialysis. Um, the supplies alone take up an entire room. Um, the first delivery was 40 boxes, and I'm not talking little things. I'm talking boxes like this, you know. Took up a very big portion of our basement in our new home, and our old home didn't have that space. The other aspect of it that the first, our, our old home and the home that we had been interested in would not have been conducive is all the bedrooms were on the second floor, and they were small. And the piece of equipment that she needed for dialysis is not small and it needs to be right in the bedroom. It can only be about 15 feet away from you. So he knew, and he set us up, and he put us where we needed to be, even though we were taking a leap of faith financially. So um, the other financial aspect that was nerve-wracking is, is this stuff's not cheap. You know, medical expenses are crazy expensive. The vest that she had to wear for three months. It was a defibrillator vest to protect her in case her heart decided to quit. That cost, with insurance, it cost us $500 a month. And that, that's just one item out of all the stuff that we were dealing with. So, you know, you're, you're anxious. Finances are seeming stretched already. And it just felt like our wealth was, you know, on the line. Um, but thankfully, we had good insurance, and that even, even though it was still $500 for that vest, other things were covered completely, and that good insurance that we had been paying for all that time was paying off. So Job also lost his family and his friends. Um, most of mine were very supportive. There were a few who backed away gradually and others who disappeared abruptly. 
I don't know if I was too much for them or if they were tired of hearing me whine or what, but it hurt. At a time of high tension for everyone, there were misunderstandings and disagreements um, in our families, in our extended family. Um, and while we try to have a spirit of forgiveness, words wound and are hard to forget. And family in the context of our marriage. Um, to be brutally honest, many days I wanted to give up. I felt sorry for myself. I questioned God. Why me? What have I done to deserve this? Is God really so good because it doesn't feel like it right now? Where is he? Um, I was depressed. And our marriage suffered. Um, to be honest, I thought I was going to die. And I tried to prepare Lyle by distancing myself from him emotionally. I tried not to need him. Uh, we argued and fought. He took over household chores. I couldn't do anything. So he was working full time, doing the chores. He was grocery shopping, running the kids around. He was paying the bills. He had all the financial burden. Um, and while it was necessary, I was basically useless and felt like a burden. The average wait time for a kidney transplant in Western New York is three to eight years. Um, Lyle was in it for the long haul, and he showed that to me. But yes, we had a lot of stress. So wow, we've covered a lot of ground, you know, in just a few minutes here. But and, and there's so much more that you know, it's amazing when we try to condense this down. But many days, all of this just seems surreal. How could we be at this point in our lives? Um, what got us here? Why us? <clears throat> How am I going to? I'm going to hold this all together. Um, God. <clears throat> He got us here, and he's how, I'm, he's how I'm going to hold it together. Um, in his wisdom, he built trust, faith, and family into and around us. People were stepping up in so many ways. Um, food, um, a team of ladies who were cleaning our house. Um, so it was time for me to, to, to exercise that faith and trust that he had Wendy in his hands. Now, many of you know that I am a doer. I have to, it, if there's a problem to be solved, I've got to do, I've got to work. But I could not do that with this. You know, it just, it, it wasn't there. So I decided it was time to change up my prayer life a little bit. So Mark eleven twenty four says, Therefore I tell you to, to, to that <laughs> therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And that's exactly what I needed to do. So uh, this is what my prayer became morning and night. I would beg him for a kidney to become available inside of six months. Now I knew that might not happen. I knew that sometimes he says no, but I was going to choose to ignore that. And um, some days, honestly, it was the only prayer I could bring myself to pray, but I wasn't going to quit. Um, morning and night, I became obsessed with it. And my beautiful daughter, Abby, would decide to join me in that prayer and pray it right alongside me. And he answered Five months and three weeks exactly to the day he answered. So August 9th, 2018, just a little over a year ago, what a great two o'clock in the morning phone call that was. Um, we have a kidney for you, a perfect match. So off we went making phone calls along the way. Pastor Mark, we called him at like six Five. in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lyle was a bundle of energy. Clean the entire house. <laughs> and I was quiet, uh, trying not to get my hopes up. See, I had Googled this enough to know that it wasn't a done deal until the kidney was inside you and working. But God is greater than Google. <laughs> he is so good. He is all we needed. 
He showed up over and over in friends that did surround us and became his hands and feet to us. You all came. You cleaned my house. You folded my laundry. You cut my lawn. You provided meals, entertainment, kept my child. You took me to appointments. You filled in for me at work. And actually, a few of you offered me your kidneys. God used you to minister to me. And you prayed and prayed, and God showed me that I was not abandoned and alone. So we all lived happily ever after. <laughs> Except it's continuous. Um, I was rehospitalized after the transplant for dehydration, for infection. I take 15 pills a day, which are most, some of which are anti-rejection. I'm still weaker than I'd like to be. The steroid I'm on caused cataracts to grow in my eyes, slow healing, and weight gain. I worry over transplant rejection, um, sweating out every appointment and blood test. But I just have to be still and know that he is God, and he shows up every time. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle, Wendy. Hey, as we wrap up, I want to just very quickly give you three takeaways today. If you're still in Job, three life lessons from Job. Number one, you heard it from Lyle, Wendy, God is in control. God is sovereign. It may be hard to believe, right? It doesn't make sense, but it doesn't make it any less true that God is in control, even when all hell seems to be breaking out around us and our world is coming apart at the seams. God is in control of what is happening in your life today today. And, and though Satan launch attacks on you, you can still believe that God is in control. Number two, God is sufficient. Can you say that? God is sufficient. Say it again. God is sufficient. God is enough. We don't need God's stuff to, for him to prove that he is good. Today, he would come alongside you and say to you, I haven't left you. I haven't, I haven't forgotten about you. I will be your helper. I will be your healer. I will be your source. I will be your hope. Can you trust God to be enough for you? Number three, God is full of surprises. Did you know that? God is full of surprises. So we see this all over in the life of Job. And I want to just take you to the end of the book, here, the end of the story, end of chapter 42. After Job prays, he, he, the, the God launches a, a, a deal with his, uh, Job's friends. He takes them to task. And, and so they have to come and beg Job for forgiveness. And so he prays for his friends and so on. And then, and then, um, and then we have this wonderful thing in verse 10. Uh, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him at his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord brought upon him, and each one of them gave him a piece of silver and gold. And the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, that's twice as many as he had before, 6,000 camels, twice as many as he lost, 1,000 yokes of oxen and 1,000 donkeys, again, twice as many as had been killed, verse 13, and he also had seven sons and three daughters. Same as had died in the house collapsing. You say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what, what happened to the double? Why, why not 14 sons and six daughters? Because Job didn't lose his daughters. They just went home to heaven, right? He knew right where they were. He didn't lose them. So verse 16 says, after this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so he died old and full of years. There it is. Three life lessons from Job. God is sovereign. God is sufficient. He's enough. And God is full. Awesome.